Okay, so this week's video is about quantum mechanics and the electron and everything we have going on there. And we're going to start off kind of where we ended in class, talking about that wave particle duality. And that brings us to de Broglie. And I know that is not the correct French pronunciation, but I don't speak French. Um, so de Broglie really kind of revolutionized what Bohr was talking about. Again, Bohr was able to explain hydrogen and the uh, emission spectrum that hydrogen gave off with no problems. He said if electrons occupy these distinct energy levels and require energy to go up in energy levels and release energy when they come down in energy level, then it will 100% explain those four colors of light that we see hydrogen getting off. Um, what he could not do was explain why those energy levels were distinct. And that's where de Broglie comes in. He said, well, you were talking about, uh, and Einstein and Planck were talking about light behaving as particles, and that being how a photon could excite an electron. But what if we actually think of as the opposite of that and think of electrons as waves? And so what this looks like then is when you combine all of these ideas, you get something that looks like this. So let me explain what we've got going on here. So de Broglie would say, you can only have full and complete wavelengths to create standing electron waves in an atom. And when you have a standing electron wave, that means where it starts, it goes all the way around, I'm not freehanding this for a reason, I'm tracing because it's hard. It has to meet back up with itself in a complete revolution of wavelengths. So you have a whole number of wavelengths, whole number of wavelengths. And if you don't have a whole number of wavelengths, you end up with this situation where you start off and you go all the way around and the electron doesn't meet back up, you don't get a standing wave and this is not stable and therefore not possible. So that means if we thought of this as say, energy level number three, you would get energy level number four by adding one more entire section that started, say, um, let's see if we started here, then you would go down and up and here again. That would be one whole section. You would have to add another whole wavelength to reach the next energy level. And when you add a whole nother section, well, clearly that's way out here and it's much bigger. And not only that, that is what dictates that you can be in one energy level circle or another energy level circle, but not in between. So it's really de Broglie that kind of figured that out. And that's very nice of him that he did that. Um, but that meant that if electrons could be waves, well, can't everything be a wave? And the answer to that question is, well, yes. Yes, it can. Everything can be a wave. Um, and that's really weird. So this is the equation that de Broglie came up with to explain the uh, wavelength nature of all types of matter. And I kind of mentioned this in class, but what you get here, this is our lambda again. So this here is in wavelength right? And that wavelength is in meters. Uh, this H, we should recognize that, that's Planck's constant. Constants are nice, they make our calculations easy. Uh, let me switch pen colors to make this a little easier. Uh, so you have Planck's constant in the numerator, and in the denominator you have this M, which is mass, and here I'm going to trip you up because that mass has to be in kilograms. Kilograms. So that means most of your masses are going to be reported in grams and you have to move them to the left three decimal places to put them into kilograms. So pay attention to that. Um, and then 
that there. I know I have been being goofy about saying frequency is new. That is not frequency because that is not new. That is a V and V is velocity. And velocity is just a fancy physics way of saying speed. And that is going to be in meters per second. So your wavelength in meters, your velocity in meters. Um, so this is what he came up with. And since you've got mass in the denominator, what you find is things with a large mass, since they're in the denominator, are going to give you tiny, tiny wavelengths. And that should make sense. So baseballs, golf balls, humans, airplanes, not a real wavelength. It's going to be so small, it's practically imperceptible. But for things that have tiny masses, like electrons, like protons, uh, like high-speed atoms when you fire them across, those small masses are going to give you discernible wavelengths and you'll actually kind of see them. So I want to bring up that simulation again in class and just kind of show what that looks like when we are talking about um, the model in um, of the atom. Okay, so here's our model of an atom, and again, we've got our wave. So the thing I want to uh, highlight here is this looks just like Bohr, but imagine that the electron is really like a little rubber band, okay? And it can bend and it can stretch into higher things. So if we turn our light on, okay. So if we're going to watch it as it goes up, it's like it stretches out. And so you can kind of see that it's in those distinct little things uh, and if we switch it to the 3d view there you can really see that up and down sort of wave nature and if we slow it down a little that makes it a little bit easier to see something is going to hit it and oops that one didn't hit it let's let's hit it come on hit my electron ah these guys these these guys are going to hit it okay so it hits it and you can see that is a standing wave. So this is de Broglie's conceptualization of what is going on. And it it backed Bohr up and it made sense, but it's it's still not actually quite right. So we need to go on to see what exactly is quite right. And to do that, we are going to talk about um, something different, and that is Schrodinger. Okay, so Schrodinger and Heisenberg come up with a whole next step in uh, the workings of electrons and quantum mechanics. And what they come up with tells us that you can describe the behavior of an electron, not necessarily through waves or particles. It's both. It does both at the same time. It is both a wave and a particle at the same time. So if you ever hear about Schrodinger's cat experiment, that's kind of what it's talking about, but it's really some high level particle physics. So don't worry about it. So what I do want to talk about is Schrodinger and his wave equation. It's a giant math equation that I even didn't do in college, so you certainly don't need to do it. But what you need to know is that that equation, if you plug in a bunch of variables, then it can work out the locations of electrons, not just for the simple atom of hydrogen, but it works for all atoms. And that possibility there, where it could figure out all atoms as opposed to Bohr, who really only worked out hydrogen, that's how we knew Schrodinger's got it right. So this equation, what it does is it lets you figure out where an electron can be found, but it won't tell you where an electron exactly is. And that is frustrating because that speaks to this notion of probability. We are no longer tracing a path, all right? So clearly, we are no longer tracing a path. I want you to let that sink in for just a second longer. Bohr said that electrons are traveling in orbits. You can predict orbits. We are the planet Earth. I know where Earth is going to be so many days from now because I can mathematically predict that through math because I travel in an orbit. Electrons do not. 
They do not trace a path. They move around in random motion, and that random motion produces what you have been told before, probably, are electron clouds. And those electron clouds are not really what we think of as clouds. They are probability distributions. So, what does that look like? Well, it looks similar, but it does look a little different. So I'm going to go back to our model and show you how that looks differently um, through the simulation. Okay, so here's our simulation, and I want to point out a couple of things. First off, this energy level diagram that's been over here this whole time, it looks a little different. It's spread out. It's got more stuff. Second, where are my rings? Where are my orbits, my energy levels? I don't see them. And the reason you don't see them is because, again, there are no paths, all right? No paths whatsoever. So let's turn our gun on and see what we're going to see. Whoa, what was that? That's a funky thing. That's weird. So what this model is showing you, those little fuzzy areas, those are probability distributions. Those are areas where the electron might possibly be found. We can't know exactly where it is because the darn things are so fast that they're moving and we're not going to be able to see them. But this does lead to a set of predictable shapes and locations that we can use to determine where an electron should be. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like quantum numbers. And quantum numbers, uh, you don't have to know a whole lot about quantum numbers, but you do need to know that a set of quantum numbers is going to tell you everything you need to know about an electron. So first off, quantum numbers, well, there's four of them. And the first number, as it says in your reading, the first number determines the size of the energy level. So we tend to say that this first quantum number is the letter N, which we've already used to represent energy level. So again, these are not orbits. That's a little different. So the next, the second quantum number, well, the second quantum number determines what we refer to as shape. So you saw in the simulation, there's some different shapes, and these typically we refer to sublevels. <coughs> so we have energy levels, and those energy levels have sublevels. So our energy levels go like 1, 2, 3, etc. You're used to those. Our sublevels, our sublevels have letters. There's sublevel S, sublevel P, sublevel D, and F. And they have different shapes. S is a nice solid sphere, pretty simple. P has this weird dumbbell shape. You kind of saw that one in the simulation. D does this kind of cloverleaf thing. And F starts looking really, really strange. So when I say different size, I mean if I had a 1S, that might be a circle that's this big, that sphere. But if I had a 2S, well, it's going to be the same shape, but it's going to be bigger like that. So you can imagine this is like some Russian nesting dolls where you keep having larger and larger circles all on top of each other. Okay, so my third quantum number. My third quantum number is going to determine the orientation in space because we are dealing with three dimensions. And in three dimensions, that means we have things that exist on X, uh, a Y and a Z zooming out at you. Um, so, for instance, this typically refers to what we think of as orbitals. Not orbits, different from Bohr. All right, so we've got one orbital, three, five, and seven here, and F. And I'm going to put all of these things together in a pattern on Monday. Uh, I mean on Tuesday, but we're not quite there yet. And then this last one, the fourth quantum number, determines what we call spin. And things can spin up 
or they can spin down. And this refers to individual electrons.